So in this video, we are going to take a look at the methods of transferring thermal energy between objects or systems. And the three ways that you may well have heard of before, we've got conduction, we've got convection, and we've got radiation. But something that's common to all three of these energy transfer mechanisms is that it always travels from a hot object to a cooler object. That's, we always know the direction of energy transfer. Okay. So we're going to start off by actually defi defining a piece of terminology I'm going to be using consistently throughout this video. I'm going to be talking about internal energy quite a lot. Uh, so internal energy is what we get when we add together all of the energies of the particles in a system. So imagine we have 100 atoms and we know each of the atoms kinetic and potential energy if we added together that for all 100 atoms we would get the internal energy of that system of atoms so what happens when we supply thermal energy to something is its internal energy increases and this could happen in two ways we could increase the kinetic energy which another way of describing that is we could say its temperature would rise or we could increase its electric potential energy which means we have got a phase change happening, which would mean we are increasing the separation between the particles. So that's when we heat an object. But if an object is cooling down, um, what's happening is it's transferring thermal energy to another object and its internal energy is decreasing and we can have the opposite changes to what we've described. OK, so that's internal energy and how it changes with heating. So let's look at our first method of energy transfer, and that's conduction. So this is all about particle collisions. So we can see on the diagram, we've got some sort of material there, and we've put one end next to a flame. So what we're going to do is we're going to transfer thermal energy from the flame to the atoms of the material. And the ones closest to the flame are their temperature or, uh, or the kinetic energy, I think, is a better way, is, is going to rise. And what they're going to do is they're going to collide with the particles around them. And then so you get like this chain reactions of collisions going along until all of the materials um, well, or the atoms kinetic energy has increased. So this process really only happens effectively in solids. So you can get conduction in liquids and gases, but because the particles are more spread out, these collisions are far less frequent. And so we don't effectively transfer energy by collisions in liquids and gases, but in solids, the transfer is pretty effective. So some materials are described as being good conductors. So let's first of all explain what we mean by being a good conductor. It means energy transfers from one end to the other quickly. So it's all about speed of energy transfer. And metals are good conductors because they have a unique property in that when they're bonded together to form a metal like a wire or whatever it is, that allows electrons to move freely throughout the wire. And those electrons can assist in the movement of energy. So that's why energy can move faster, because not only have we got the collisions transferring energy, we've also got these electrons transferring energy too. And so you get faster thermal energy transfer. Okay, okay. so our second method of thermal energy transfer is convection. So conduction relies on collisions. Convection relies on density differences that you can create. So what we've got here is a kettle. And in this case, we're using a flame to heat it or, you know, it doesn't really matter. So what we're going to do is the metal that the kettle has on its base is going to conduct thermal energy from the flame to the water. And then the water that's nearest the heat source is going to increase its internal energy. And as things internal energy increases, it's going to expand or its volume is going to increase. So if we've got the same mass, but we've increased its volume, that's going to cause a density decrease. And as we've seen in previous topics, if you have a lower density than the fluid in which you are, you're going to experience a buoyancy force greater than your weight force, and it's going to move upwards. 
And then that's essentially created a space which the cold fluid around, in this case, the water, is going to move in to fill. And we set up what's called a, con a convection current. So we get um, the it moving upwards directly above the heat source and then the colder moving in, forming sort of circles or convection currents. So conduction, we said, happens mo pretty much exclusively in solid materials convection cannot happen in solids because you need the particles to be free to move around inside the material to set up the convection currents so it works really well in liquids and gases but it doesn't work in solids okay all right so just to have a look at some scenarios where convection is responsible for some things that you will see all the time uh, so wind is actually a convection current so what happens is um, essentially there will be a region that is warmer than another one uh, for whatever reason maybe the intensity of the sun is higher um, there's a lot of factors that can cause this but anywhere you have a warm region the air above it is going to expand and its density is going to decrease and it's going to experience a buoyancy force upwards so air over a hotter region is going to um, rise due to the buoyancy force and it's going to be replaced with cooler air and that movement of the cooler air is what we call wind so that's one example of where convection applies another one is actually in the movement of tectonic plates um, that's responsible for like earthquakes and volcanoes and all that fun stuff so the magma nearest the center of the earth or the core is much hotter than the rest so it experiences again an upwards buoyancy force and it creates a convection current which means that is what is responsible for moving the plates of the crust around um, so again another application of convection currents so the final method of energy transfer is commonly called radiation but we could give it its full name we call it it's actually infrared radiation so uh, this is something we've covered previously so we've studied electromagnetic uh, radiation before and infrared is just one of the spectra of it so some key things about electromagnetic radiation um, so first it moves energy from a hot region to a cold one um, that's so that's we've seen that already the other key thing is it doesn't require particles in order to have transfer so it can go across the vacuum of space for example uh, but in terms of the what the temp how the temperature of an object affects the radiation so to get the higher frequency radiations we need a hotter object so for instance with a star which is very hot they can produce the visible ultraviolet and some of them even x-rays but things on earth are not as hot so they produce lower frequency infrared so it's infrared that we're going to focus on because we're interested in sort of the energy transfer methods here on earth so because of the temperatures of things on earth they're sort of in the between you know around zero degrees up to maybe hundreds those kind of temperatures of normal objects so that's why we get infrared spectrum because they're not too hot so we get a fairly low frequency um, and we can put this to use uh, we if you would like to see at night we often distinguish objects instead by their temperature using the infrared radiation that they are emitting and that different temperature objects emit slightly different frequencies or wavelengths of radiation which is how we're seeing things so that's how we can actually put it to use so we can actually change the sort of the amount of energy that an object can emit or absorb by changing some properties of it so the temperature is one thing that will affect how much energy a object emits but we can also change some other properties that will affect it too so let's say we want an object to absorb uh, infrared radiation what we're going to do is we're going to make it black that has an effect of increasing the absorption and we're also going to make it matte which is basically the opposite of shiny so if we want to absorb thermal energy we would have something matte and black if we don't want it to absorb energy so if we're in a hot country and we want to not be absorbing as much of the sun's radiation we would make it white and we would make it shiny which is why a lot of houses are white if you go to hot countries um, and so we can also have a look at how to make good 
emitters of radiation as well. So it turns out things which are good absorbers of radiation are also very good at emitting radiation. So if we have an object which is black and matte, it is also, um, in terms of emission, it will emit more thermal energy per second, or it'll have a higher rate of emission. And it's the opposite with white and shiny, they would have a lower rate of emission. And then just to finish off, um, we've talked about how hotter objects emit higher frequencies, but in addition to that, hotter objects also have a higher rate of thermal energy emission as well. So there's actually two changes that we get with the temperature of objects, and that completes this video looking at the three methods of energy transfer.